Hello, and thank you for watching this presentation by the American Iron Society. Please support the organization by becoming a member. Go to irises.org and click on join. Thank you. Uh, I'm really happy to be here and to uh, give this presentation. I'm, I'm used to giving presentations to local groups and uh, master gardeners and uh, the public and, and garden clubs and so forth. Uh, I've not often gotten to talk to uh, Irish people who probably know well uh, more about this than I do. So this was, will be interesting. Uh, I have uh, a, a quite a few slides here to go through. Uh, this is going to take about 50 minutes or to an hour. But uh, if we need to adjust the time, we can. I can probably cut some things. Uh, I usually start this presentation talking to groups with this um, slide on taxonomy, but with this or with this group, you uh, know this already, I'm sure. I show it only to make the point that there are now five uh, recognized species of Louisiana irises. That's the uh, the AIS position that there are five, uh, and uh, but it's in dispute to some degree, and uh, the uh, the work. Uh, that is that the AIS position is based on, I believe, is by uh, Brian Matthew, a, a 1981 publication. Uh, and Matthew was with the Royal uh, Gardens at Kew in England, and he was a traditional taxonomist. And uh, a lot has happened in the years since 1981. Uh, geneticists have gotten involved, and there's a lot of uh, quite a lot quite a large scientific literature on uh, speciation uh, using Louisiana irises as, as an example of how uh, species can develop through natural hybridization and so forth. And many of these studies uh, question the species. But what I want to do this evening is give you a broad overview of Louisiana irises, where they came from, the species, a bit about their uh, natural history and how they were dis discovered, so to speak. The hybrids, um, a little bit about ways to grow them, although I'm sure you know as much about this as I do and more about your area. And then I wanna talk a little bit about saving the wild, the wild irises. I usually start my presentation with just some pictures of gardens because I want the audience to understand where all this winds up. I'm trying to get people interested in the plants so that they'll be comfortable to listen to all I have to say. So these are just some shots out of gardens of what the irises, modern Louisiana hybrids look like. Uh, there's, there's a wide range of colors. As you know, the color range of Louisiana irises is, is extremely broad. Uh, the color range you know, goes, of course, uh, in the species ranges from yellow and red to blue and white. And so the, the hybrids can be just virtually anything and, and they increasingly are. So uh, gardeners see these shots and they become interested, I think, I hope, in, in the irises. They look particularly good near water since they are wetland plants and they grow in water uh, just fine, and uh, as well as in uh, normal uh, garden beds. Uh, this is in the uh, New Orleans in this, uh, the sculpture garden and associated with the Museum of Art. Um, and that's the Museum of Art across the water. The irises look good in this setting. This is um, a picture of uh, the display garden of the Greater New Orleans Iris Society that we maintain there. I've been meaning to Photoshop that hose out of the picture for years, but I just have never gotten it done. They put it in the shed now anyway, so it doesn't really matter. Uh, so on to where they come from, and that takes us to the species. And uh, up until 19, the 1920s, there were only three recognized species of Louisiana irises. Iris hexagona, which was uh, named in 1788, uh, fulva in 1812 and brevicollis in 1817. 
And then in 1929, Giganus Arulia was named and Nelsonii was the last in 1966. Um, I'm going to run through these species, including a couple of putative uh, species. Uh, the first being Hexagona, since it's the oldest. The picture on the left is from a publication called Addisonia, which was uh, produced in the 1920s by the uh, New York Botanical Garden. And uh, I'll talk a little bit more about this series of pictures later. But uh, it compares to the picture on the right, which is a South Carolina specimen of Hexagona. Uh, the, uh, the original type a specimen of Hexagona came from South Carolina, but it is uh, nearly extinct there if it's not in extinct in that state. Uh, we only have this, this um, uh, iris because a man in South Carolina, John Wood, sent it in the 80s to Joe Mertzweiler in Baton Rouge, and it's been passed around, and we have it in New Orleans. But uh, we have uh, tried to get other specimens out of South Carolina with no no luck at all. Maybe maybe a recent find we're we're hoping. But Hexagona is uh, an iris of medium height. It's a relatively late relatively late bloomer. It has a slightly zigzag stalk. It's blue, sometimes dark blue, maybe darker than the ones in Louisiana, the other species. It tends to have kind of spoon shaped. Uh, falls, and uh, people say that it's characterized by yellow-green foliage. Um, the range, the range of the uh, iris is is one of the things that's in dispute. This view from uh, the, the uh, USDA about nine, about 2015 shows that the range re starts in South Carolina encompasses all the irises of Florida, uh, over all along the Gulf Coast, all through South Louisiana and over into Texas. And the scientific community accepts this view still, that all of these irises are hexagona. They don't recognize any of the subspecies. The newer view is that hexagona is limited to South Carolina previously, it extends down through Georgia into northern Florida. Uh, the irises in Louisiana are Giganus cerulea, which is a different species, and that most of the irises in Florida are Iris savinarum. And savinarum was a name that was given by Dr. John Small in the 1920s, but later abandoned. But now it is being revived. Uh, this uh, the Biota of North, North America program produces really excellent maps of uh, distribution maps of the irises, and they now take the view that Savinarum it, it is represents uh, that all the irises of Florida are Savinarum, that only these remnants from South Carolina and Northern Florida are Hexagona, and that the irises of Louisiana are Giganus cerulea. Now these up in the northern, these light greens in the north Louisiana have to be botanical hallucinations because I don't believe those irises are, are, are could possibly be Giganus cerulea, but I don't know what they are. They're in some herbarium someplace identified as Giganus cerulea. The Savinarum is taller than Hexagona. It is an early bloomer and not a late bloomer. It has a straight stalk, blue to purple, it has more elongated flower parts, and it's native to coastal and South Florida. Um, it, uh, this is a picture of one that we have in uh, collected and brought to New Orleans, and you can see that it looks very similar to the Addisonia print from 1923. Uh, this is an example of it from Brevard County, Florida, which is below Orlando, and it's a little bit different looking of uh, this plant in New Orleans grows five feet tall, sometimes very vigorous, uh, a, beautiful, a beautiful iris. There is, a, there is a paper that has just come out by a geneticist at University of Florida named Evgeny Mavrodiev, who believes that there are more species in Florida yet, that 
that that Smalls uh, irises, some of them, one called Iris Kimbalii and another one called Iris rivularis, were uh, inappropriately abandoned as species. And so there is uh, some reason to think that maybe there are more species out there in Florida. Florida is, uh, there, are, there are areas of Florida that are more elevated, and so there are environmental differences there. So it's reasonable to think that there might be differences in the irises. The East Coast irises have not been sorted out thoroughly. This is what they kind of look like in general. All of these are collected in Florida. There is a white form, very, very rare. And then they range from uh, blue to blue purple to purple. Uh, what you don't see here is red. No red at all, no fulva, no Nelsonii, uh, a much more limited color range in the East Coast irises. When you get to the Louisiana irises, uh, Gigantis aurulia, uh, Gigantis aurulia, by the way, means giant blue, and uh, it is a, indeed a very, very tall plant. Uh, named by Dr. John Small in 1929. Now, I'll, I'll talk a little bit about Small. Uh, this, this plant can grow up to seven feet or more in the swamp. It is a huge uh, flower in, in captivity and tamed, as it were. In the garden, it might be four, four or five feet tall, four feet typically, but in the swamp, it gets to be very big. It has a flaring flower form. When it opens, it all, the standards are always upright, like in this picture. They do uh, drop some when the flower matures, but that is a very typical Gigantis aurulia form. It's uh, blue, occasionally white. I would say white is rare, but not as rare as in some of the other irises. It has a very straight stalk and it grows in the wettest conditions of all the Louisiana irises, in a, in a few inches of water uh, or in the, what they call the flotant, the, the mass of vegetation that uh, grows, uh, that, that lives in the swamp, that floats in the swamp, and it can actually grow in that. And if you try to walk out and pick one up, you'll sink down to your, to your thighs and the, it would look like the iris is growing on the surface but it's not, it's, it's, it's floating. This is a typical picture of a, a swamp with Gigantis aurulia. This picture was taken near Napoleonville. And in a wooded location like this, you see it uh, at the edges of the swamp and then back into the swamp, you see these clumps of, of giant blue irises. When the canopy gets thick enough, they, they will disappear and you won't see them. They, they, they need some sunlight. This is another picture of them in a swamp. Uh, this is a third picture in the swamp. And the, <clears throat> you will see uh, something there that is unusual. Um, this, uh, if you look at these irises over here uh, to, the, to the right, they are typical blue Gigantis aurulias. Down here, these are nearly pink and in this particular area of swamp, there is apparently some introgression of, of uh, possible, probably full of genes. And if you look in this swamp and you take your binoculars and peer back into the swamp and you, you can't walk out there, um, you'll see clumps of, of pink Gigantis aurulias. Uh, I've never seen that anywhere else. There's one other thing about this picture that is odd, but I, I'll just leave that up to be a mystery for now. Uh, the, um, when, when you find Gigantis aurulias growing in full sun, as, as in an open marsh, they get extremely thick like this. Um, this is uh, a picture of taken on a field trip, an SLI field trip a few years ago down to the Abbeville area. And that's Benny Trahan, one of our uh, explorers, uh, who, uh, uh, in fact, the lead explorer, the, the person who probably knows more about the irises in the wild than any, anyone. And he dug this out of the swamp to, to demonstrate how tall they get. That's a, that's a tall flower. 
uh, again, uh, it's now recognized that these gigantic aurelias are what we have in South Louisiana and along the coast. Uh, this, this picture is the oldest picture I know of of the irises. This was taken in uh, late 1860s, published in 1872 of a scene in New Orleans. New Orleans was once, once full of Louisiana irises, but now it's totally developed and none of, none of these exist. But you can see the massive clumps of irises going, going all the way into the, into the distance. This is a, just a white form of it. Uh, the, many of the locals don't really appreciate them and they refer to them as ditch lilies which is hard to, it's hard to take, but uh, nonetheless, that's the truth. Iris fulva, the second, uh, no, the third species. This is one of the reds. This is a brick red uh, copper. Sometimes it's called the copper iris. It's rarely yellow, but there are a number of yellow forms of it. It's a medium height, 24 to 30 inches, typically. It, it has branching. It does not have a completely straight stalk. And you find it along streams and, and sloughs and bayous and deltaic of soils, where, you, where there are bodies of water, rivers, bayous, whatever, that overflow, and the land is built up by the uh, deposits of silt. That's the habitat of fulva. It has uh, small uh, flowers. The petals often droop. It's not as an individual flower all that impressive. Sometimes it's very pretty, sometimes it's just, it's not really impressive. This shows how it can branch. It doesn't always do this, but there are forms of it that do. And much of the branching that we have in Louisiana irises is brought in uh, through fulva. Uh, it was uh, named in 1812 and uh, the type specimen was collected in New Orleans and was uh, shipped to England where there was great interest in it. I'm told that at the time there were no red irises. This, this was, this was uh, in nature and that uh, this was created a sensation in, in England. And uh, this was published in the Curtis Botanical Magazine in 1812. It's ironic that it would be 1812 since we had a little war going on with England at the time, but. I don't think it had anything to do with them taking our, our iris and to, to, to London. The, the um, habitat of fulva, the distribution of fulva is, goes far into the north, all the way up the Mississippi River into Illinois. It is uh, again a, a delta plant. And so it hugs the, it hugs the river, uh, more plentiful on the west side than the east side, which is hillier. In Arkansas, it follows the Arkansas River. In Louisiana, it follows the Red River and the Atchafalaya River, as well as the Mississippi. Um, this is what it looks like in the, in the wild. Uh, typically, typically this brick red, kind of orangey red. Uh, this is a scene that is uh, due, taken uh, due west of Baton Rouge. And if you're driving along and you look down in these ditches, you see the spider lilies blooming in the spring, <clears throat> and you'll see fulvas in the mix in with the uh, spider lilies and other other wild flowers. It's, it's uh, striking to see while the individual flowers may not be that fantastic, it's, a, it's a creates some beautiful scenes. Well, this is a nice clump of them in a, a borrow pit south of a few miles south of LSU. Uh, Benny Trahan, again, I mentioned as an explorer, and he's made it his business to go around finding um, areas where you would expect to find Louisiana irises. And he did it back before there was Google Earth using topographical maps. And he found all of these examples of fulva growing in places where there were no other irises but fulva. And uh, this is this one in the upper right is the typical color. The one in the upper left is common, fairly common too. But the rest of them are very unusual, and I, I don't really know why. Whether there is uh, there's some uh, ancient integration of the genes of other irises that has endured in the 
and they pop up occasionally and vary. But uh, I show this in part to indicate that while there are five species or six species or four species, however you want to, whoever you want to listen to, while there are only a limited number of species, that does not mean that there's a limited number of the limited amount of variety in the, these irises. And you begin to see why the hybrids today have are, are so varied. It's because the species were, were quite varied already. Hybridizers have not done all the work of bringing out these different colors. Brevicollis is uh, the shortest of the Louisiana irises, under 20 inches, the latest to bloom. It's not it's not often that it's blooming at the same time as fulva and gigantis arudia, but weather conditions sometimes conspire to have them bloom together. It has a very zigzag stalk, unlike the straight stalk of gigantis arudia. This is a good characteristic that has been brought into the hybrids. It allows the flowers to be displayed cleanly. Uh, Revocalis is um, blue and rarely, rarely white. Uh, it grows in the, the driest habitats. That's not to say dry, but it's not flooded. It does, does not occur in standing water all the time. It may occur in wet areas, mucky areas, but it is uh, uh, relative to the others. It's, uh, it tolerates drier conditions. It's most likely to go dormant. It's, it's not showy because it's short and because the flowers bloom down below, for the most part, below the tops of the foliage. Um, this shows you some of the range of uh, colors and forms of uh, Brevicollis. This is a, a few more of them that show the you know, variation from near white to uh, dark, fairly dark blue. And uh, this is a white form that we, we didn't really have any white forms available. Um, until recently, there were pictures, old pictures of them, but it, it, white is very rare in, in um, Brevicollis. But a couple of years ago, Kent Benton on his farm, he has 75 acres east of Baton Rouge in Livingston Parish. And he, um, he and I actually were uh, found it. He took me out on the four wheeler, which uh, going through the ruts of his uh, farm was like being on a mechanical bull. And uh, it, it was uh, really quite an experience, but we, we found a white Brevicollis, which is uh, now uh, been named by Kent as Louisiana Snow, which is uh, a very ironic name. Uh, this shows the zigzag form of our Brevicollis. Whoops. And then this is the county level distribution of Brevicollis. You see that like Fulva, it goes far to the north, farther really than Fulva because uh, uh, Brevicollis is uh, reported in Ontario, southern Ontario, Ontario, and in the counties right on, the, on Lake Erie in northern Ohio. Um, and between Fulva and Brevicollis, uh, that injects a lot of hardiness into the genes of the, of the hybrids. Uh, Louisiana irises grow generally, or can be grown generally around most of the country. And that's true because the hybrids are not based on just coastal plants. They're based upon plants too that, that grow in cold, in a cold climates. Uh, this shows uh, Brevicollis blooming down in the foliage. A lot of times the foliage will arch over. And so it's not a very spectacular plant in the garden, but it uh, is a nice cut flower. Uh, this, it, this is a 1935, picture of uh, a field of uh, Brevicola south of Baton Rouge and it forms it can form an almost uh, ground cover when it's in the under, in the right conditions. Uh, there is one form of it that's pink and I, I don't know what to make of this. I know that um, this was collected near Baton Rouge also and uh, many many years ago and uh, it if you cross it, if you self it, you get all blue brevicollis. So it must be a sport. I don't think it's a natural hybrid. I think it is just a form of brevicollis. The last species is Nelsonii, and it's one of the most interesting because it is red like fulva, but tall like Gigantis arulia. It's often redder than fulva, 
it has larger flowers, much larger flowers. It's thought to be of hybrid origin, but stabilized to become become a, a species that, that breeds true. It's red, but there are occasionally yellow forms found. And it grows in swamps. It grows in water. It grows in uh, in swamps like Gigantis aurulea, whereas fulva will grow in um, in mixed woods and uh, wet woods and at the edges of wet woods. Frankly, you see fulva a lot of times in ditches. Uh, uh, people have created a good habitat for fulva by digging ditches and having roads, roadsides. Uh, but they are they're naturally uh, in the woods, but not in not in really wet conditions like like uh, uh, the like Nelsonii. It has an inconspicuous signal. It's in, it's hard to find pure species because this is so localized, uh, and uh, the area around it. And I'll show you some pictures in a second. The uh, area around it does have Gigantis aurulea and fulva and brevicollis. So when you get around to the periphery of the Nelsonii area, you begin to find uh, natural hybrids. But you get into the, the core of the few square miles of swamp where this developed, you'll find pure Nelsonii. And it has been, it's been very important in hybridizing. Uh, this shows you how localized it is. This little yellow dot down here are the, is the Abbeville Swamp. Abbeville is located right up here. And it, it is a tiny little few square miles of swamp where this develops on near, right on the Vermilion River. This is what they look like in uh, back in the swamp habitat. This is, these are Benny Trahan's pictures. Uh, it is, it's a gorgeous plant, it can be a beautiful plant much bigger flower than fulva. Uh, now in in a garden the differences are not as great but in the in the wild this is a huge plant. This is a Google Earth picture of its habitat, what is left of its habitat. Uh, and you can see that agriculture is encroached has encroached on it and if it were economical to fill in all of this remaining swamp it would be gone and this habitat would be destroyed. This is the most uh, endangered of the of the Louisiana iris species. Uh, this little feature right here is interesting. This is a this is a pile of rice hulls. Farmers in the area come in and dump their rice hulls here, and uh, I have friends that have been here and seen it, and they say this pile is 12 feet tall. And if you use Google Earth to measure the dimensions of this roughly a rectangle, it comes out to over 20 acres. So over 20 acres of rice hulls 12 feet deep have been piled into the habitat of the Abbeville, what we used to call the Abbeville Reds, and now the Iris Nelsonii. Uh, this is mainly, this property is mainly in private hands. It is um, endangered because it's small, but also because canals have been built. You see a canal here, you see a canal here to change the hydrology of it. This is the Vermilion River. They're, so the, the hydrology is not like it was over the years when these plants developed. And uh, some think that the areas, some of the other species are encroaching in, into this and it's not as pure as it once was. But there's, and I don't know what it is about this that makes it exclusively Nelsonii territory because there are uh, there are there are Gigantis aurelias around here, and they look like they ought to love this area. This looks like a swamp where you would see Gigantis aurelias, but you don't. You see Nelsonii, so it has a, a niche and a habitat of its own. This is a, a Benny uh, Trahan discovered a, the yellow form, and it had been lost for a long time. It's a yellow Nelsonii. You can tell a Nelsonii from a fulva by one one trick, and that is the shape of the style. In a fulva, the style forms an, a, a kind of an arch over the anthers and the the, the stigma. Uh, the bee, of course, lands lands here and crawls down and gets pollen on its back, and goes on to fertilize other other uh, irises. In the Nelsonii, the um, 
the, the style forms a tube, either a complete or a partial tube around the anthers. And so a bumblebee can't get down there. And so hummingbirds become important pollinators of Nelsonii, whereas they're less important for the other uh, species. If you have, if you're growing an iris that you think is Nelsonii, and it does not have a tube-shaped style, is not Nelsonii. And I know of hardly any commercially sold um, plants that are sold as Nelsonii that actually are, because I think the reason is is that people have collected red irises in the vicinity of this swamp thinking they were getting Nelsonii, but not getting enough into the interior to get the correct plants. This is Benny Trahan again. I'm giving him a, 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 a lot of publicity tonight and he well deserves it. He has dug this out of the Abbeville swamp, uh, a Nelsonii that's taller than he is. Benny's at least 5'10". And uh, if he were, if he had dug a fulva, it would come up to about the bottom of his shirt. But Nelsonii is, is a much taller plant. So how do we get from these species to the modern cultivars? Uh, there was, of course, I've already mentioned the dates of these things. There was a period of what I guess we call early discovery. And some of these plants were named back in the 18, 1700s, 1800s. But the period from 1920 to 1945 was the time when there was the most activity and the most discovery, or when they were recognized and, collect, and collected and uh, extensively, and when there was early hybridizing. There are a number of people who are very important in this period. Uh, since that time, mainly we have uh, dealt with hybridizing and horticulture and preservation, although Nelsonia was not named until relatively late. I've got to play tribute to at least three people who were um, pioneers, so to speak, in developing in, in the discovery of Louisiana irises. One was Mary Nelson of New Orleans, who began growing them in, in 1909. That's the earliest record we have of anybody growing these in, uh, in, uh, uh, formally. Uh, no doubt. In years past, people who lived in the vicinity of the irises dug them up and brought them into their garden, but there's no record of, of that. But Mary Nelson was active in New Orleans, and she eventually became a founding member of SLI in 1941. She sold them. Uh, she was a very interesting person, an engineer by training, uh, trained at Texas A&M, but not given a degree because they didn't give degrees to women. And uh, years later, they came back and gave her uh, an engineering degree. But uh, Caroline Dorman was a prominent conservation in Louisiana, and she discovered them in 1920 and brought them to Briarwood, which is her, her home in North Louisiana. And she was, uh, people networked a lot with her. So she, her uh, work promoted the irises a lot. Mary Swords de Bayen was a 1930s native plant activist. And when the Society for Louisiana Irises was formed in 1941, it was called the Mary Swords de Bayen Iris Society. And that name stayed on for several years. And she had passed away by that time. The, but the, the main figure that I have to mention is Dr. John Small, who was the curator of the New York Botanical Garden. And he, he was a prominent taxonomic botanist who worked um, extensively in Florida. And the story is, is that he was on his way to Texas from Florida and coming through New Orleans, he saw fields of viruses and he had already studied viruses in Florida. And so he knew what he had. And he came back every year into, until 1932, roughly, and uh, he, collected and he studied and he named over a hundred species, quote species, unquote. Uh, they, many of these names were, almost all of these names were later abandoned, but he was very active in uh, discovering these and publicizing them. Uh, this is, he published three, three books on the flora of the Southeastern states. This is the second edition. So he was a, 
he had very uh, prominent credentials as a botanist. Uh, his theme was that there are at least 100 previously unrecognized species near New Orleans, and they were endangered. Uh, he, he, he promoted the idea that these species were uh, already, in 31, already endangered. And uh, he wrote articles for the Journal of the New York Botanical Garden. He commissioned these photographs, uh, not photographs, these, these paintings in the magazine Edisonia, published by the Botanical Garden, so that the things he was discovering, the irises he was naming, were, were shown in color. And at that time, there was not a huge amount of color photography. And so these, these uh, prints of these irises was a sensation. Uh, today, only the Savonarum and Gigantis aurulia are, are species names still, still recognized as valid. Oh, he gave talks around New Orleans. He said things like, that South Louisiana is virtually the iris growing center of the world, center, iris center of the universe. I mean, of course, the press picked up on that. Uh, he counted the fact that there were only 18 species of iris known in America at the time, but more than 100 with 300 color variations just around New Orleans. That's not even counting the rest of Louisiana. And so the claims by someone with his credentials were sensational locally. It created a frenzy of, of uh, collecting and activity. Uh, it, I, I could go on with many anecdotes of things that happened in Louisiana at the time. This is a list of uh, the species he named. Uh, I'm, you're, you're very fortunate that, I, that they have been abandoned. I don't have to go through all of these, but uh, only a few of Savonarum and Gigantis aurulia remain. Uh, this Kimbellii and Rivularis or maybes. Uh, this uh, iris, uh, I never heard of them and noticed it today, Iris de, de, Winkle, de Winkleri. He named that one for the driver of his truck. That's, that's the Winkler right there. So he came in and he tended to name these irises quickly. There are anecdotes that show that he saw an iris for the first name and first time and popped a name on it. And uh, so he was uh, very quick to name irises uh, that he saw, and, and he knew that he was probably naming some that were actually hybrids, but he did it anyway. And the result was a huge amount of publicity for these irises in the, in the, the botanical world and locally. There is a picture of him on a collecting trip there is an article in the AIS Bulletin of July 1932 that is uh, an account of a collecting trip by Dr. Small in Louisiana. And it's by uh, Ethel Anson S. Peckham. And some of you may know that she was a founding director of AIS. She was the, uh, the person who created the first checklist. She wrote the first judging rules. She was a director of AIS for uh, many years and uh, a very prominent, and she wrote this article about what it was like coming down here and collecting with Dr. Small. You see Dr. Small sitting there in his coat, and, he, and you saw other pictures of him in a coat and tie. He, he knew how to dress properly to go to the swamp. And we always wear coats and ties when we go into the swamp just to honor Dr. Small. Of course not. So uh, this, the bubble of Dr. Small uh, burst in 1935 when a, a local named Percy Viasca, uh, who had worked in South Louisiana, knew the territory better really than Small did, who was an official with, uh, with the uh, Department of Wildlife and Fisheries. He was a herpetologist by training, but he had many, many interests. And he formed views about how many species there were and he published a paper saying there were only four in Southwest Louisiana, only four. That what Small was finding were natural hybrids and forms of the, of the four species. He included in this Virginica, which is also native, but not in the Louisiana group. So he was saying that basically there is only 
Gannis, Aurelia, uh, Fulva, and Brevicolis. Uh, in 1935, they had not discovered Nelsonia yet. It was not encountered until 1938. But Viasca eliminated the uh, many of these species that small claim. But nonetheless, the publicity was huge. And uh, the uh, variety of irises was appreciated. Uh, this is a, a picture of one called Iris. Well, it's called, it's been named Sue Fleming, but it is a collected uh, vinicolor type. Vinicolor is the name small gave to this plant, uh, but it is a first generation uh, Fulva times Gigantus aurelia hybrid. They always look like this. They're tall, kind of a wine color, sometimes a little more red, sometimes a little more purple. But you find these, these natural hybrids around. Uh, this is uh, one that small, this is the only one that we have that small named that has been abandoned. We recovered this th this year. Uh, it is Iris, it was what small called Iris Chrysophonicia. And it is indeed a beautiful plant. You can see why he, why he, why he took it and why he gave it a species name. But it's bound to be a, some sort of a, a natural hybrid. Uh, this is a this is a wildflower. Uh, don't know what that is. It has a gigantic really a form, but not color. It's it's some sort of a natural hybrid. But this is what people were encountering in Louisiana when they would go out. Well, this is a uh, deep purple, deeper than the species, uh, supposedly uh, found where uh, Nelsonii and Brevicollis meet. Uh, I don't know whether that's what it is or not, but it's a it's a collected plant. Uh, this is a collected plant. It was named for Mary Swords to buy in, but that's a, that's a, a wild natural hybrid of some sort. So. Uh, it was recognized that the Irish interest in this period was uh, intense. The newspaper said it was it amounted to almost a cult. There was that kind of enthusiasm for the Irises in Louisiana at the time. So why are they called Louisiana Irises though? And you look at all these distribution maps and they, they, uh, they show uh, Irises up into Ontario and to uh, in the upper Mississippi Valley, why would you call them Louisiana irises? And the um, name got started with uh, the painting uh, of John James Audubon of the Perula Warbler. He had it posed on a, a red iris, which turned out to be a uh, fulva. And uh, the notes, the notes associated with this painting referred to a Louisiana flag. Audubon painted this while he lived in St. Francisville, Louisiana, above, New, above Baton Rouge. And um, so that's how the name got started. But um, it, it, this has always intrigued me because Audubon did not paint the floral parts of his, many of his pictures. He had an assistant do that, and then he would come back and slap a bird on him. And in this case, he obviously wasn't too close of an observer of the relationship between irises and birds, because uh, I've never in 45 years seen a bird on an iris stalk. And one can only imagine what gardening would be like if you had, a, if you had two birds on every scape in your yard. Uh, so, uh, but, but that's how the name got started. But the real justification, I think, of calling these Louisiana irises is, is this. I would say that 99% of our hybrids today come from stock collected in Louisiana, either the species or natural hybrids that were found here. That, that's where the activity was. And there are maybe a dozen irises at the most that use a Florida iris as a parent, maybe, maybe fewer. Uh, it's possible that somebody used a full from up, up river someplace. But for the most part, I think the, the what we have today started in Louisiana with the variety of of uh, species and natural hybrids that we have uh, we have here. Now the modern onto the hybrids. Um, there have been a lot of advances from the collected plants, more colors, more color combinations, bigger flowers, new flower forms, certainly. 
uh, more flowers on the stalk, better, better substance, uh, better branching. I think resistance, many people believe more resistance to rust. And so I want to talk about the, the hybrids. And uh, so this is what we were dealing with in 1934. Car Caroline Dorman, who's an artist, painted a wall watercolor of the best Louisiana irises in 1934. It's what they looked like. Uh, the SLI, after it was formed in 1941, created uh, a Mary Swords Devalian Award. We now have a Mary Swords Devalian Medal, but we had it. SLI had an award early on, and these are the winners of the first six. Uh, the, the first one was the iris named for Mary Swords Dubai, in which was collected. But these others were early hybrids from the late 40s and early 50s. So that's sort of the baseline. So jump forward to the winners of the Dubai Inn Award, a few of them, since the year 2000, and you you immediately see a big change with you know just over 50 60 years of hybridized big, a big change um, i want to talk about the uh, forms of them and how some of the ways they differ two things i want to do from here on i want to talk about some of the features of them how they differ from one another how they can vary and then i have uh, asked uh, about a dozen hybridizers to tell me the names of <clears throat> six irises they would like to show their best or most recent or whatever they would like to show. And I'm gonna just show you uh, that series of, of slides uh, that kind of reflects the state of the art, what they're, what they're like today. So first of all, in terms of form, and this, this comes out of the judge's manual, uh, this, we, we take sort of pride in Louisiana irises in saying that we have many forms uh, and other and you can kind of see why if you look at if you look at uh, the the species you have the upright standards as one of the forms and that just is gigantus aurulia to a t you have a pendant pendant forms and that is what the species of Nelsonia and fulva are like um, and then uh, you have uh, a flaring, to, whether it's called a flaring to flat form, and that corresponds to Brevacolis more or less. It is not upright and it's not pendant. And of course, when you cross these two, you're going to get something in between. So you have a range of possibilities here uh, that is very, very wide. Uh, Semi flaring to flat is, to me, not a very good name because uh, well, first of all, what does semi-flaring mean? It's either flaring or it's not flaring. And flat, um, none of them are flat. None of them are literally flat. But, but there's a huge range between upright standards and pendant. If you look for irises with upright standards, you'll find almost none. And this is really almost a fiction. People have not worked to create these, and they don't pop up. Uh, there's an old Arnie iris called Uptight that uh, this this picture looks like a bearded iris without a beard, and it is the the most upright one that I know of, except maybe King Alex, which is a Benny Trahan iris of, that's fairly recent. Uh, I don't know how long these standards stay up, but uh, I don't. I, I was hard pressed to find any more irises that are hybrids that looked like this. So that end of the spectrum really is uh, kind of iffy as to whether the, uh, the hybrids are actually there. Uh, pendant irises are more common, but not very common. I got interested in these when I saw Rodney Barton's Majestic Velvet, a picture of that, and started looking for other pendant irises. And I, this, is, this is one of my hybrids that I had 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 and not done anything with that is pendant. And it's the only one that I ever uh, got in my hybridizing program. And I wasn't trying for it, it just popped up. So I knew that they existed and someone reminded me of President Headley, which is a Mertzweiler iris. And as it happened, Joe Musaikia had shown this uh, beautiful mama Janice at the Lafayette show a couple of years earlier and it's clearly pendant. 
And then I uh, realized that Peter Jackson has a number of viruses that are, are pendant in form. I could have shown several more of his examples. Very, very nice. So there are pendant viruses, but really not very many. Uh, most of them are, fall somewhere in between. Uh, some are flaring like these. These, these tend to be some what they call semi-flaring or flat. Uh, all of these have styles that angle upward and falls that angle downward, but they're not totally upright. Uh, some of them, um, a, a, a series of them I see, have uh, falls that are so broad that if the standards have any substance, they have no choice much except to flare upward. So you, f you see this, this form occasionally of fl flaring. Um, so, but that's a huge space between pendant and uh, between a pendant and upright. So m many of the irises, to some degree, fall in there. Uh, the open form, form there's, you have to find old ones to find the open form. Black widow is a famous and very popular iris from 1953, but almost no one. Uh, deals with these anymore. Some irises like Echafalaya and Simply Fantastic uh, are a little bit open and very, very attractive, but not like the, the species or not like Black Widow. The overlapping form has become dominant and there were a few found in nature that were the precursors of this. The first one I think that really was overlapping was W.B. McMillan in 19. 57, but now you can just go on and name, you know, picture after picture uh, that are uh, viruses that have these of uh, falls and standards that overlap. Uh, it could go on and on. These are just sort of arbitrarily picked out to illustrate it. There is also a recurved form that um, uh, is shown in the uh, Manual, but it's I think inaccurate. This this almost looks pendant. That 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 standard is drooping down. But in the recurved form, what happens is that the flower will open, uh, somewhat flaring. The falls may be angled down. The standards may be angled up. But uh, what happens as it matures is is the fall drops more or even folds under. You see, you see on this particular. A petal and, and hear how those uh, falls fold under. And so that's, I think, what is meant by the recurved form. And there are a number of viruses that do that. Um, sometimes I think it's uh, attractive and sometimes it looks like it, it destroys the symmetry of the iris. Uh, uh, I guess it depends on your angle and your preference, but uh, these, this is a definite form of them. Um, we um, Give uh, the uh, I can't even, there's something in the way of uh, my uh, of, of the title there. I don't even know what that says. But oh, uh, uh, ruffling, uh, ruffling is very common now, and uh, it's very often very spectacular. I can again go on and on uh, in describing different irises that are ruffled. They. The earliest one that was said to be ruffled was in 1969, Charlie's Michelle. And it hardly looks ruffled now. If you get something that's less ruffled than this, it's unusual. I mean, but, and Clara Gula was a famous parent that was somewhat ruffled. But now uh, you go, they go uh, to the very, very much rougher, very much ruffled. These, the bottom two are Bernard Pryor, Irises are uh, very, very heavily ruffled, very, very attractive. But uh, ruffling is, is uh, I don't know whether I really want to call it a form. I guess it is because it looks so different. I kind of think of it as an embellishment. It is a different shape, but it's clearly uh, something that we have quite a bit of now. There are doubles, uh, not very many. Uh, Marvin Granger from Lake Charles, Louisiana, found this iris Creole Can Can in the swamp, and he developed, uh, and some others have developed irises that are, have extra petaloids and extra uh, so 
extra styles, the peculiar shaped things, some of them pretty, very attractive and, and, and interesting. Uh, some of these, they're all, all of the doubles are cartwheel types. The, the, um, all the, the flower parts are the, basically the same shape. It's hard to distinguish falls from standards. Uh, and, uh, but not all are doubles. There are cartwheels that are not doubles. Uh, now colors, uh, the, these things differ in, diff in a number of ways. One, we do, of course have cells like about midnight. And then we have uh, um, a lot of ours is now have nice edging. And uh, that, is a, that is a feature that we see, see more and more. Um, sometimes the edging is broad, I call it banding. Uh, and uh, you see this on uh, uh, quite a few irises on uh, this feather and fan, which is a prior iris. I don't know whether it's Heather or Bernard, one of them tell us. I think it's Heather's. You see that it's got a band and an edge almost. But uh, these irises that uh, have that banding are very popular. Our Dorothy is a very popular iris uh, from Bernard, I believe. Veining is common. Uh, no, I wouldn't say it's common. You see it occasionally, and it's uh, it's always interesting. And sometimes, sometimes it looks pretty. Sometimes, uh, and to my eye, it doesn't. But all of these are nice, and uh, it is something that stands out among these irises as a as a variation. Uh, we do have bicolors and bitones, not that many, not so much like some of the other iris groups, but they they are there, and I suspect that they will be. Uh, coming and there will be more of them in the future. Uh, size and shape of styles. The styles can be big and long like persistent cuss or small even on a big iris like my friend Dick. Uh, tetraploids tend to have wide styles. Sometimes styles are fancy and frilly like this one. Sometimes the style, the styles contrast with the, the uh, other the color of the flower parts, other flower parts, often lighter but occasionally darker. Uh, one of the things I like is that there are increasingly variable patterns and colors on the styles. You, an iris that is not uh, different, it doesn't have edging and doesn't have a lot of fruff, ruffling, doesn't have a lot of other fancy embellishments, can another, nonetheless be distinctive by some small variation on the styles. Rochester Lilacs has these the styles edged with one with a different color, a lighter color. The green there's green influences in the styles of many of these irises. Uh, Gentilly's got kind of multiple color styles and, and so on. Uh, one form we see now, and I don't know what to make of it, is are cases where the styles are held vertically. They don't flatten out above the flower, other flower parts like they do in nature and all the others. And I don't know whether it's because I'm seeing a picture of a flower not yet fully open or whether the substance, uh, the, some of the substance in these irises has gotten so thick that uh, I'm wondering if they're not interfering with, this, with the styles. I don't know what to make of that. But I do see pictures like this, and it is a different form, and it probably needs to be recognized as a different form. It does not look the same as, as the others to, to, me, to me. Signals can vary wildly, and, and uh, just an iris can be distinctive because of, because of different signals. You could go on and on with variations on signals. Uh, Sweet Miriam has just a streak out to extending out from the end of a, of a, of a signal. It's, it's attractive and makes it stand out. Monkey Hell has a big blotch. The uh, Henry Rowland, which won a Dubai an award, has a, a very crisply defined style with some veins in it. Uh, Black Gamecock, which is probably the most widely grown, grown iris, Louisiana iris, has just a full spear. And, and go on. Uh, New Basin Canal has outlined uh, styles. Uh, I like these ones that have big splashes of color 
of a spot uh, that just spread out. Um, Geisha Eyes was an old Arnie iris, and it is the first that I know of that had had uh, signals. I said styles. I meant signals. Signals on all all the parts. Now signals on all the parts is is a fairly common thing, but back before 1987, that didn't occur. So I think the major embellishments we've seen are the overlapping flower parts, the ruffling, edging and banding, the signals on all parts, but the, some of the other variations are equally important in, um, in creating distinctive irises. Irises don't have to have all of the major embellishments. This is a picture of one of my irises, uh, Rimelod, which has none of the embellishments. It's got no edging, no ruffling, no veining. I mean, I, I kind of think, I look at it and I think, well, I should have entered that into the novelty iris category because you just don't see irises that plain anymore. But it's, but I like it nonetheless. State of the art. Now let's see what the hybridizers are saying are their favorite irises. Uh, We'll start with Robert Treadway of Carlisle, Arkansas. Robert has, <coughs> pardon me, introduced a couple of viruses in the last year or so, but these, oh, these chosen to show seedlings, and there's some beautiful seedlings here. Now, nice banding on this on this uh, orange, yellow orange iris, and edging here. Uh, I hope Robert will continue to hybridize, and I uh, will uh, introduce some of these. They look at least the flower picture looks very worthy. Um, I, um, this is Ron Besser. I, there's something on my screen that's block, blocking the names of the people, but uh, I think I can remember them. These are Ron Besser's uh, irises. Uh, he has some nice orange irises and uh, Dark Dude won um, the Dubai in last year. And it is a very impressive, very dark, uh, iris. It's hard to capture. I could show a whole page of his, of just this iris. It is so, it is so impressive. Uh, Brian Shamblin from uh, Athens, Georgia and Gardens in Tennessee uh, has some beautiful seedlings. I don't believe he's registered one yet, but you can see that there it will be cause to do so. I like these, I like, love these uh, signals on this Iris particularly. Uh, Kevin Vaughn, of course, has been around and has produced a lot of irises, including the famous Red Velvet Elvis, probably one of the best known irises and certainly the best iris name of, of uh, any, any iris. Uh, and uh, it's a beautiful red. And his lemon zest is a wonderful garden plant too. It bloomed beautifully in New Orleans this year. Uh, Hooker Nichols in Dallas is got some spectacular irises. Uh, these, I believe, are just being introduced th this year. He's, uh, he's introduced a large number. But this Atlanta is burning is uh, about the, the fattest, uh, roundest, biggest iris I can imagine. And these signals are just gorgeous. He also is, has this broken color iris. There are not many of these, but there are a few, like splitter splatter. And they're interesting, and people people really like them. They enjoy them. Uh, Ron Killingsworth in Mooringsport has hybridized some, and one of his, our friend Dick, won the uh, uh, Dubai in Award a few years ago. I, I like that color and the the edging and the veining in that in that iris. Uh, uh, Scott Lively in Baton Rouge, and Scott is one of two hybridizers who also sells plants directly. That's his website. He has got uh, a number of new irises on the market now. And uh, I love this Chimes Street iris. And uh, I wish I had thought of the name Never Ending Rant. That is a, that's a wonderful name. And uh, so I expect a lot of our uh, good irises from Scott. You're beginning to see that these are all uh, big and round and ruffled and and fancy irises, frankly. You kind of see the direction we're headed in. Uh, Joe Masakia in gray has got some nice irises. I, his Acadian sky at uh, the Baton, in Baton Rouge, uh, the Baton Rouge Botanic Garden at our convention a few years ago was just spectacular and extremely vis uh, vigorous. 
that is, is a good iris and Ico Ico. I've never actually seen that iris, but I, it, I like, it's an intriguing picture and I've heard good things about it. And I showed a picture of Mama Janice in the pendant category. It's a beautiful, beautiful iris. Joe's got a number of things not yet out that are very nice. Um, Cindy Dufresne in Carrier, Car um, well, in Mississippi is Career, Career, Mississippi. In New Orleans is Carrier. So I'm always wanting to say Carrier, but in Mississippi is Career. She is uh, another of the, one of the two that uh, sells irises, and uh, that's her website. This ginger splash is a nice color. She's got some nice, some nice, nice irises. One she has that I like that she didn't choose to show is Silver Run Creek. It's a silverish uh, iris and it just bloomed beautifully in New Orleans this year. So it looks to be a good garden, garden, garden plant. Heather Pryor and, uh, and uh, Australia. Uh, of course, Heather has been hybridizing a lot and it, I know it had to be painful to pick six. And uh, these, these are all beautiful and spectacular. I'm, I'm particularly fond of the veining and uh, around the, uh, in the, in the, in the uh, signals. And uh, there's three of these here that just stand out in that regard. And Heather's always pursued orange irises. And this is a, a beautiful one here. Uh, Bernard uh, also has f fabulous irises. Uh, I like, again, I like this, sig this form of signal, but uh, there are, are uh, and this this one is really nice nice color very unusual to me, but uh, there's more coming from the priors. Uh, Peter Peter Jackson in uh, Adelaide, South Australia, has got some very nice irises. These he uh, he really goes for these edges, and I'm not sure what to call these edges. Are they, are they crepe crepe edges or or exactly what? But they're they're very distinctive. Uh, uh, I like all of these, and uh, I like that star signal. And I'm I'm a sucker for light blue irises. So this lake Jindabyne is uh, very intriguing to me. Uh, Don Greaves in uh, Australia and Perth, Australia, also has some very nice irises. I don't think Don is hybridizing any longer, but he still has things coming out. And uh, this uh, I I love this. Uh, very this needle-like signal on this red iris that's, that's particularly nice uh, these are mine and you can see that i my irises don't tend to be as big and round and frilly as others there I, I like that flaring style although i do have some like claire fontenot that are big but uh that's just a, a preference of mine and that's uh, those are the uh, that's the state of the art, and you see you kind of see where it's headed, and uh, it, it's not headed back this way. It's not headed back in the direction of these uh, uh, open uh, irises with uh, with standards that stand up. And so I always ask the question: Well, well which of these is prettier? I mean, Arrows is a Mary, a Mary Dunn iris, and you have every embellishment piled onto that iris. You've got edges, you've got ruffling, you've got style, you've got signals on all parts, you've got green in the styles. There, it's all, it's all there. Uh, whereas this is a picture of an, I don't even know what iris that is. It's something that popped up at Longview Gardens in New Orleans a couple of years ago. But it's a bit, to me, a beautiful color and a beautiful form. It is, it is uh, a form that I consider to be graceful and elegant. And I think it is, uh, I think it really is uh, a shame, and I include myself in this, that hybridizers have not worked to develop that form further. Uh, I know that that iris has poor substance. It's like the species, they're, they're thin. And this is probably very close to species, but that's a problem that hybridizers could work on. And that form, if we're going to say that Louisiana irises have very wide uh, 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 array of forms, we need to work on some of the other forms. Uh, there's nothing wrong with what's been done, but it's not getting it's not getting broader. It's getting more. They're getting to be more alike. 
uh, occasionally there's a problem. These irises, uh, these we get some, sometimes get stalks that, that uh, where the they're held in such a way that the flowers won't open. Well, that'll be taken care of in the long run by the marketplace and by the judging rules. And, uh, and I don't think it's a worry, but it's something that is. Uh, it seems to be associated with uh, maybe heavy substance, or I, I don't know what exactly. You see this just occasionally, and maybe this is just not well grown. Uh, ways to grow them. I'm not going to do too much on culture, uh, uh, but um, I don't even know how I'm doing for time. But uh, I, I tell people that there are two main things they have to do. And that is to assure consistent moisture and to fertilize the irises. Um, in New Orleans, we get 60 inches of rain a year. So, you know, you would think that would be enough, but it's, it's really not because a lot of it comes with, you know, one or two hurricanes and you've, you've used your 60, you've used your 60 inches, but we have droughts. And so if you get a period of drought, then that hurts the irises. They look scruffy, they don't bloom as well. It's important to ensure consistent moisture. You, know, you do that by avoiding tree roots, for one thing. And then if you get people coming in and saying, my irises don't bloom, why are my irises not blooming? And you say, did you fertilize? Well, no. Yeah, that's usually the answer you get. People don't understand, don't understand that. Uh, in, this area, you need to provide a half a day of sun, at least. In the north, it's you need more sun. But if you look at the way I grow these things, is that I grow them I, now. I used to grow them just in the ground in flower beds, but now I grow them in these mortar mixing tubs, and I don't drill any drain holes in them, and I line them up in my flower beds, and I put bricks around them so I don't have to go to the trouble to sink them into the ground. And I mulch them heavily so you don't see the tops of the of the tubs, and I have my sprinklers on a timer so that these things are staying wet. And they're, these irises are growing in little bogs, and they're extremely happy. And it's not much trouble. They're easier to weed than that way than they are in just a flower bed. And so I think it's a good way to get to provide consistent moisture to the plants. I don't know that this works everywhere in every part of the country, but I'm doing it and I, I think it's a good, a good approach. Uh, if you can get a, a mulch like this in the north, well, that's, um, that's a good mulch. Uh, in New Orleans, we get about an inch of this every 10 years, so this won't do us any good. But if you are in totally New York, like MJ Urist, who used to operate uh, Louisiana Iris Gardens, uh, that that uh, snow cover can protect from the cold. And so through that gate in the uh, summer, uh, that's what her irises looked like at one time. And the snow cover helped protect them that way. If you don't have access to snow cover, then uh, you need to, to mulch heavily is my understanding. And I'm saying this as somebody who gardens in New Orleans, I have no experience in uh, anywhere else. So uh, if I'm wrong about it, somebody can tell me. But if they're, if they're in pots, you've got to protect them. Irises will freeze in pots if there's a hard freeze. They will not survive. In the ground, they will. If they're mulched, if there's snow cover, uh, then, then they'll do well in most, most of the north. Uh, used to be a man in active in SOI and who grew, Bob Bledsoe, who grew in South Dakota. And he he was successful. He had some failures, but he generally was successful. And that's a hard climate. Uh, in the north, they ought to be planted in full sun because they, they will start, they will get out from under the snow, they will start growing later in the season, and they have to bloom before the fall. And so they need full sun in order to get enough grow, growth in to bloom. Even then, they're likely to be a little shorter and have fewer bud positions than they will in Louisiana. Uh, MJ says that hers have more vivid colors, so there, there's a, tra a trade-off there. Uh, in the north, you have to deal with boars and uh, budfly maggots, and uh, I, I'm of no help on that. We don't, do not have either of those in Louisiana. 
occasionally a bore, but nothing that I would do anything about. If in some areas you have to deal with alkaline soil, uh, but uh, the old literature used to say you had to provide an acid soil. That's just not the case. Uh, my soil in New Orleans is 7.1, 7.2 sometimes. Uh, we have alkaline water. They're native here. So they don't have to be an acid soil, but if you have 6.5 soil, well then that pH is fine, but they don't, they don't need to be in an acid soil and a, a, a mild amount of alkalinity is okay. If it's too alkaline, then you need to do something to acidify the soil. Texas, West Texas and California, and there are places where you have to do it, but it's, you don't have to have, um, you don't have to have a soil that is uh, uh, necessarily uh, uh, acid. A couple of words about our project is pervert to preserve the species. This is an SLI project and GNOIS is uh, one of the uh, main sites for it. Uh, it goes back to Small's observation that uh, even in 1931, these, these uh, irises had been, uh, were, were declining. Uh, he said that in his 1931 paper, after a thorough survey of the iris lands in the New Orleans region, we confidently calculate that through rural improvements and urban growth, about 80% of the iris fields of a half century ago have been ravaged or destroyed. So in 1931, compared to 1880, 80% decline already. You know, urban development, lumbering, agriculture, dredging of bayous, uh, levy, uh, building levees, which prevent the uh, overflow of water and the, the silt building up and new nutrients coming in, uh, herbicide spraying of roads, all of that had an impact. And that was before the oil industry got a hold of South Louisiana. And, the, and this top map are pipelines that have been dug through the marsh, uh, these uh, bottom pictures are the results of uh, dredging canals to get to oil uh, oil rigs and then not filling them back in. And basically uh, what has happened in South Louisiana is that the marsh is just collapsing. It's literally subsiding and, and salt water is coming in and salt water is being ushered further inland. And there's uh, all sorts of issues now as to who pays for this damage. But the damage is, uh, is not the, that they're worried about is not to irises, although that occurs. It is damage to the, the uh, overall environment in the city of New Orleans, which no longer is protected by 100 miles of uh, healthy wetlands, but instead is, is, uh, is uh, uh, ringed by areas that have subsided like this. So we're trying to uh, preserve these uh, species uh, and the, the genetic variety of them. Um, the, uh, when you lose a group of viruses, you lose, uh, a, 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 you lose that diversity. You may lose this one right here, for example. It may not occur, but in one location. So we're trying to assemble as many different forms as we can uh, in order to preserve that diversity. Um, the, uh, uh, the only these are not threatened, and, and literally they're not about to go extinct. There are plenty of brevicola still out there. There are plenty of fulvas still out there. there God knows there are plenty of giganos aurulias. Nelsonia is threatened, but uh, the rest of these are not. But the variety is threatened. So we're trying to preserve this. We grow them in a, a city park in New Orleans it gives us about a quarter of an acre. And we grow a hundred and around 150 different forms of the species, plus a lot of uh, cultivars in this property. And it, it gives our club a real mission and is uh, one of the reasons that we seem to be doing pretty well. So uh, you've, uh, there's more information available on the, the SLI site and the GNOIS site. You've made it to the end of this. I'm sorry this, if this was overly long. Uh, there, is, there is my email address if you want to contact me uh, uh, for, for anything. I uh, would love to talk to anybody.
And that's all. Thank, Thank you. you.